Hello there, this is John Evans. Welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. In today's episode, we will be discussing the mystical theology of J.R.R. Tolkien. In particular, his understanding of temptation, of sin, of grace, and redemption. It's important to know before we begin our investigation that Tolkien was, admittedly, first and foremost, an author. He resisted time and time again, particularly in, I believe, the second introduction to The Lord of the Rings, an allegorical reading of his own text. But the kind of allegory which he is referring to here was a specific literary mode where certain characters, persons, places, and objects, such as the ring, Sauron, and Aragorn, would have to be read precisely as being relevant to issues in his own time and day. We tend to use a much broader form of allegory now, where the symbols invoked can stand for many alternative meanings, and are not as fixed in a particular formulaic mode. We must also note that Tolkien made personal statements time and time again, making it clear that he was thinking theologically as he was writing his work. Many people tend to quote Tolkien as saying that his work is essentially Catholic in nature, and that he felt that the Blessed Virgin Mary and some of her characteristics may be present in the character of Gladriel. Nevertheless, these points are often objected to by modernist critics, who would prefer to see Tolkien's work as an unintentional amalgamation of Christian, pagan, and philosophical themes. I, on the other hand, believe that we can read a very clever and very intended series of Catholic images, which are embedded into the text of the Lord of the Rings. But without question, these intended meanings are far from explicit and often work on a linguistic level. We also see themes which are central to Augustinian theology. What do I mean by Augustinian? Well, the works of Augustine of Hippo found in his Confessions and in his City of God, emphasize the core nature of Catholic teaching in regards to original sin and grace. By one man, Adam, all of humanity has fallen. And so, according to St. Paul and Augustine, the last Adam, Christ Jesus, has to come and atone for our sins upon the cross, and rise again the third day. Because we are sinners, because we are fallen, we are in need of God's grace to sustain us. And as Catholic theology clearly states through all the Church Fathers, we must cooperate with God's grace in order to reach um, the relationship, the religion required of us with Him. In the same way that we are called into a loving relationship with our brothers and our sisters. In this way, the broken family relationship that we see in Genesis chapter 3, when we were banished from Eden, is restored in the New Jerusalem, a new Eden, the city of God, rather than this fallen realm, this veil of tears, the city of man. In the meantime, we are a mixed body. Now, This is incredibly important because if we look at a character such as Frodo Baggins, who carries the ring of power, a tangible symbol of great darkness, of binding into shadow, we see him battling on one hand with a desire to constantly put on the ring to make himself invisible from the eyes of the world. And that this impulse is always seemingly never to initially do harm or to do evil for its own sake, but because he is attracted to the lesser good, namely 
he is attracted to the idea or concept that if only he put on this ring, which he knows time and time again is not going to make anything better, he will be invisible from the eyes of the world and from his opponents, from his enemies. Inevitably, by putting on the ring, he accomplishes the exact opposite. He enters into the world of the wraiths, into the world of the demons, under the eye of Sauron, the lieutenant of the Dark Lord, Melkor himself. And he moves out of the realm of God's grace and into a state where he is almost in mortal sin or cut off from that grace. Now, as a result, the psychology of Frodo Baggins throughout his journey towards Mordor is incredibly evocative for us. When we carry our sins, when we bear them like a cross, it is noble. Frodo is called the ring bearer. As we are called to bear our own crosses to Golgotha. And yet at the same time, when we cave in to those temptations or to those crosses, when we cave into sin, when the ring is put on, we remove ourselves from under the shelter or protection of the grace that is offered us. And so the carrying of the ring, which is often described as a wheel of fire in the return of the king, the last installment of the Lord of the Rings, is a sign of our continual struggle with what Augustine of Hippo would call concupiscence. Another interesting point, which has come to mind over again, is how this plays out on Weathertop, the mountain or hill in the Fellowship of the Ring where Strider, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, Myriadoc Brandybuck, and Peregrine Took, and Samwise Gamgee, and the ring bearer Frodo himself are surrounded by servants of the Dark Lord, the ring wraiths. But before they are surrounded, Aragorn, who is true heir to the kingdom of Gondor, begins telling the hobbits a story. The story is the ancient legend of Beren and Luthien, a mortal man who falls with an immortal she-elf, and from their line, their bloodline, grace enters into the human family. This was one of Tolkien's most personal stories. Luthien was admittedly based off of his relationship with his wife, Edith. And on Edith's gravestone to this day is inscribed the name Luthien. And on the gravestone of Tolkien is inscribed the name Baron. And the whole key structure of Aragorn's story is the understanding and the comprehension that although death is going to come to all men, nevertheless, the gift of God, which is to bear up suffering as a kind of self-sacrifice for one's friends, is always present, as Luthien eventually lays down her life for Baron. And so both are raised in the Silmarillion from the dead. While all this is going on, the ring wraiths, who are currently off screen, as it were, off stage, are down the hill. It is only after the song is done being chanted that they are permitted to slink back up and surround the hobbits and Aragorn. Now, Tolkien drew often a comparison between music or song and prayer. In fact, in the Silmarillion, his book of Genesis, as it were, the whole universe is brought into being when the choirs of the Ainur, the angels, sing before the throne of God, and through them the world comes into being as a kind of fiat. And so, when Aragorn is chanting this lay about the love of man and woman, which is very evocative of the last chapters of the book of Revelation, where the believer is seen as the bride and Christ is seen as the bridegroom. It is in this way that the enemies of Christ, the enemies of God, are cast away and cast aside. One last note 
before we conclude this podcast. There are many instances where Tolkien does not translate the Elvish which is being spoken. When Frodo approaches the witch king himself, carrying his small hobbit blade, a barrow dagger, he cries out in Elvish, Ah, Elbereth, Gothonia. What most people do not realize is that if translated into English, at least this is what I've been told, I'm no Elvish expert, the words come out to, Hail Star Kindler, full of grace. Again and again, the high character of Elbereth beyond the sea is seen as evocative of a woman who intercedes on our behalf to the throne of God. She herself is never truly seen as the creator, but only an intercessor, only an, uh, an intermediate between the creator and us. And as a result, we see some aspects of Marian theology here. Mary is the highest of all saints, and she is a woman to be venerated in the same way that we have Elbereth as someone to be venerated who intercedes for us before the throne of God. While Elbereth is not the mother of God in any sense in the Silmarillion, she is still the highest topos of woman who is presented besides figures like Melian or Luthien. In the same way, Mary is seen as the highest topos of woman according to Christian theology, being the mother of our creator, Jesus Christ, and in some senses, the second Eve, whose yes to God undid the no we see in Genesis chapter 3, leading to the fall. Last but not least, one more quick note. Aragorn is often seen as Isildur's heir, the one who is to undo the curse that Isildur brought into Middle-earth by refusing to destroy the One Ring, which he cut off from Sauron's hand. Only one of Isildur's bloodline can undo the evil that has been done in the world. In the same way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the last Adam, is the only one who can undo the sin of Adam because he is of the bloodline of Adam and he is also both true God and true man. In this way, because he shares in our humanity and yet is perfect being true God, can he help undo and atone for the wrongs which we ourselves have brought into the world through sin? I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And I look forward to exploring more issues associated with Tolkien, the Catholic faith, and the Lord of the Rings.